Hey, and welcome to Journey Church Eva. Our mission here at Journey is to help you discover your real life purpose in Christ so you can make a difference in your world. We would love to hear from you. Check out the show notes for a link to send us an email and a link if you want to give. There's also a link for prayer requests. We have a prayer team that will touch God on your behalf. So send us those prayer requests and let's all watch God move in your life together. You will also find the like, comment, and the subscribe buttons below. Go ahead, hit all three of them. But most importantly, we want you to hit the share button and let's send this message to those of your friends and family that may need some encouragement today. Now, here's today's message. We hope it blesses you, challenges you, and helps you grow stronger in your walk with Jesus. Let's pray before we go any further. Father, we thank you. We dedicate this First Fruit Sunday to you to set a standard for our year that we're going to be about our Father's business and you've got plans for us this year, God. Say that with me. Say, God's got plans for me this year. And Lord, because of that, I don't want to miss anything you are doing in my life. And so, Lord, we start this, this, this First Fruit Sunday off in your word, about your word, to us and through us. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. amen. All right. Now, a lot of times I will ask the Lord, what's the vision for a year? What's the vision for this? And, and I've got a lot of vision. I've got more vision than any. i got anything else, but I like vision. Amen. And, and when I began to study and read and kind of just seek the Lord on my own, and Lord, what, what's this year going to look like? What's, what's the message to the, the theme of this year? Something like that. And sometimes I get a theme for the whole year. Sometimes it's just for a little bit. But I really believe the Lord spoke to me in this, and I'm going to put it up on the screen, that 20, 2013 is the year of the body of Christ to be ready. Amen. It's the year that the body of Christ needs to be ready or prepared. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking the same thing I was. Okay, Christ could return. He could return today before we get out of here. I don't know. I know he's coming back. He won't be late and he won't be early, okay? That's my end time theology right there. He's coming. He won't be late and he won't be early. But until he does come, we got something to do. Are you with me? We've got a life to live on earth to hopefully get other people prepared for when and if he does come, or when he comes back, not if, when he comes back. Can I have a better amen? amen? So the part about let's make sure that we're a body, the body of Christ, which is the church. The church needs to be ready for anything that 2023 throws at us. Because I remember going into 2020, the church wasn't ready. And everybody was talking about 2020, oh, this is a year of visions, this visions of God going to happen, and out of nowhere came a virus. And because we didn't see that thing coming, most people didn't. And when it got here, we, we didn't, wasn't prepared. We wasn't ready to deal with it. Well, can I tell you, I don't know what all three, two, 20 through 23 is going to throw at us, but I can tell you through the word, we can face anything coming at us, good or bad. Amen. Can I have a better amen? amen? But our job is to be spiritually sharp, attentive to God's word, and knowing before it gets here, and we can do that, amen? And getting that prophetic utterance and dreams and visions to be ready for yes, the revival, be ready in case Satan tries to throw a wrench, be ready for controversy, be ready for God to move throughout anything of your life. And when the body is not ready and something bad happens, it takes over. I'm tired of seeing it take over. This, we take it by, by force in the name of Jesus. Can I have a better amen? But you got to understand something. You're not just a church attender. You are the body of Christ. And so if you agree that the body of the church needs to be ready in 2023, honey, that means you need to be ready. Every one of us, me too, you too, us together. Matter of fact, real quickly, a couple of scriptures you're probably going to hear every week. This is going to be a series, uh, four week, four parts, and then we're going to have a fifth uh, Sunday that will blow you away. Matter of fact, the fifth Sunday will be five for five. Some of y'all know what that is, some of you don't. You need to show up. How many of y'all know what five for five is? We're going another five for five up in here the fifth Sunday of this month. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and then I'm going to go to verse 27. But chapter 12, verse 12 of 1 Corinthians says this, the human body has many parts. Somebody look around and say, oh yeah. Oh yeah, lots of stuff here and here. Okay. Human body has many parts, but the many parts make up how many? One whole body. Not one dismembered body. Not one sick body, but one whole complete body. So it is with the body of Christ. 
So in other words, if you're not in the body, then the body is lacking. It cannot produce. It is handicapped. It cannot, act, it cannot activate itself in full and maximum potential if something's broke or missing amen. or not functioning properly. Can I have a better amen? amen? And that's why I believe the body of Christ is not ready for a lot of things, good and bad. Amen. I talked to you a few weeks ago. How many thinks an end time revival would be great? Yeah. <laughs> Ten of us. But then, I'll, and the reason you're not shouting is because if you were here a few weeks ago, I told you, it'll get into your personal time if we want real revival. Yeah. But see, we don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to give up us time to have revival for God's kingdom, for people to get saved, healed, delivered, set free. We like our Sunday suite on about an hour, hour and a half on Sunday, and we feel good. Yeah. And that's all we need. Don't ask me for anything else, Lord. And guess what? We'll even fuss about that hour, hour and a half on Sunday sometimes. Yeah. Help us, Lord. But yet we say we want all this stuff. But yet we're not willing to be a part of that body that's going to produce this thing. Amen? Amen. And, and God says to me that it's going, it takes everybody for a church to work. Amen. It takes you. We can't have church without you. This church don't exist without you. Right. Yeah. Can I have a better amen? amen? Anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, drop down to verse 27. It says this right here. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Touch your neighbor and say, is there anything about that you don't understand? You're not here to be a spectator. You're here to be a participator in everything of the glory of God. Amen? Hallelujah. And when everybody does its part, the body functions at maximum potential. It's the most effective thing on the earth when everything is working as it should because all the parts are joined together, working as one whole, complete, healthy body. It's a beautiful thing, but that's not what I'm going to preach on today. It's talking about, I said, you, you are the body. What kind of body does Christ want? Well, right out of the gate, I want to tell you, go ahead and put up the first note. Christ wants a body that prays. Now, we're going into 21 days of prayer and fasting. And, and, and I've got to be honest with you, and I'll get to this here in a minute, but I want to stop right here, and I want to show you what prayer looks like when you pray for people. I've got a couple of pictures. I'm going to have them put up in just a minute. I'm not going to wait till I call for them. Get them ready, though. I've got a couple of pictures that you can tangibly see the difference prayer has made in people's lives. When you've been praying for someone that's been walking in the darkness and you finally see them come into the light, this is what it looks like. Put it, go ahead and put that up. It's an awesome thing. I mean, that's, I mean, here, now leave that up there a minute. If you're looking at it on your left, that's Gorman. Is he in here? Or is he up in children's ministry? He must be up in children's ministry today. All right, have him stand up and testify about how great it is. <laughs> he has been a lifelong Auburn fan. And we've been praying and praying and praying for darkness to be gone and light to come in. And behold, the light has come. <laughs> and then you've got Chauncey. Where you at? You up in here? You upstairs? She's right back there. I mean, glory to God. She's been a Texas fan her whole life. But through the prayers of a church and her husband... She's come to the light. You have witnessed already a miracle on the first fruit Sunday of the Lord. Say amen. amen. Now, don't send me the stuff going, I sacrilege it in the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, Alabama's not a God. And if he, you think he is, then he makes a terrible one. Okay? It's fun. Look at your neighbor and say, it's okay to have fun. All right, I love that, but we got to go ahead and get past that. But I do want to show you that, okay? Miracles can happen through prayer. Can I have a better amen? amen. But let, uh, can, can everybody say, let's get real. <laughs> most Christians, be, and, and this, listen to me now, most Christians really don't like prayer. Because you can tell it. Yep. <laughs> I mean, look at the empty seats in here. Right? I mean, you can tell when Christians don't like a prayer life. Oh, it's going to get real in here today. A lot of Christians see it as something that's a chore. It's, it's a problem for me to pray. It's a, oh, it's a, oh my gosh, I really have to. And especially if you ask them to pray out loud, oh, I'm embarrassed. It's an embarrassment. It's a drudge. It's a chore. It's something they feel like, well, I have to do it. I mean, that's my, part of my Christian duty, I guess, or something. And it's almost like a dread to pray and have a prayer life with God. And isn't that a shame? That's a shame. To some Christians, 
they use it as a get out of jail free card when we get in trouble. We want to run and ask God to honor our prayer when you haven't honored his request to be in prayer all the time with him. But yet you expect him all of a sudden because you have a need, you got to do this, Lord. And then what you've been taught about prayer is if you've been in a place that says, God answers prayer, God answers prayer, he loves prayer. And then when he don't answer it the way you like, then you're mad at God and then you won't pray anymore. Because he didn't answer your prayer the way you wanted him to. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, not descri- listen to me. I'm not describing lost people. I'm describing the church, the body of Christ that don't pray right. and don't have a prayer life. Look at Jay and say, get a life, get a, life. a prayer life. <laughs> but yet, how many of you, by the raising of your hand, would agree with me today and saying, as a Christian, you ought to be praying? Come on, raise your hand if you believe that statement. Christians ought to pray. We know this. Yet, we struggle with it. And we struggle with it because Satan knows the power of prayer, knows the power of a praying church, knows the power of the church coming together 21 days praying, setting aside a fast of something to connect with God and call out our community because he knows God honors prayer. That's why it's such a dredge sometimes. That's why you don't feel qualified to do it. That's why you get frustrated in prayer sometimes. Because Satan is fighting you tooth and nail to say that your prayers don't matter. You're not good enough to pray. Look at all you've done. How could God answer your prayers? And the only way God will never answer your prayers is if you don't ever pray. Could I have a better amen there? We agree. Christians need to pray. Yet very few Christians have what I call a consistent prayer life. Again, they'll pray in times of trouble or times when they want something that needs list. But God's not just about giving me my needs. He wants to have a relationship. God wants to talk to his body. How many of you like to talk to your kids? God wants to talk to his kids. Not just once in, once in every blue moon when something's wrong. He wants to talk to you every day. To know you're okay, to know what, what can I do for you? How can I help you today? What are you struggling with? He wants to give you the advice that no one else will give you. But, 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 but what is prayer? And man, prayer has been given a definition of this long and that long and so many things. Can I give you just the stripped down simple version of prayer? Go ahead and put that up, please. Prayer is talking to God and listening to God. And sometimes when we talk to God, we don't shut up long enough to listen. (laughs) Come on. Come on. Can I have a better amen up in the house of the Lord? We talk to God or we pray or we beg or we plead or we bargain or we do whatever we got to do with him. But then when we get through, we just shut up and go on. And I want to challenge you during this time, as much time as you spend talking to God or for God or about him or begging him, pleading, bargaining, whatever you do it. Spend at least, start out with maybe a quarter of the same equal amount of time just being quiet and listening. Now, I don't know if you know this about me, but I've never been diagnosed ADD or OCD or any of those alphabet letters. That's because it wasn't around in our day. If it would have been around in my day, I'd have probably been diagnosed as ADDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDDD
And the reason you women get upset and frustrated about that is because you don't have that box. For the love of God, we have it. Let us alone. <laughs> Let us enjoy that one little bit of nothing box. Praise the Lord. I done knocked my whole thing off my head there. But prayer is talking to God and listening to God and for God to speak to you. And he will. It may take you some time, but I promise you, he will speak back. And if you don't think he'll speak back, just get in his word while you pray. After you pray, maybe be quiet, direct me, God. Or he may put a subject on your mind. You start looking it up in the scriptures. Oh, this is what the Lord says about that. It's amazing. God's awesome. Amen? Amen. Now, I, I read it this past week or week before. I can't remember, but I jotted it down. But one guy's definition of prayer, and I love this too, and it's not going to be in your notes today, so you might want to write this down. Prayer is a time to connect with God and confront the enemy. Man, if you, listen, if you want to stomp the devil's tail this year, go in prayer and get him. When you're talking to God about him, because God's got you in that time, 100%. Amen? So you, you communicate to God and conquer your enemy in the presence of God. Can I have a better amen there? But let me ask you a question here. How many times has these very words either come out of your mouth? Now, I want you to raise your hand here again. That way we all don't feel bad. But how many times have you either said it or you've heard someone say this? Well, all we can do now is pray. <laughs> or another version of it. Well, you know, there's nothing left to do now but pray. Right. How many of you said it or heard somebody say it? Raise your hand. That way we don't feel bad. We've all done it or know somebody's done it. Well, what's wrong with that, Pastor? I mean, there's times when there's nothing left to do to pray. No, there's never been a time when there's been nothing left to do but pray. It's never been a time like that. And as a matter of fact, you'll never have to hardly ever, may never, ever say that if you've got a prayer life ahead of it. Oftentimes, the reason we think the prayer is the only last thing to do is because we try and everything else to a certain point. Oh, yeah, let's toss it to God and see if he can handle it now. Maybe if we'd have handled it with God back up here, we'd have never got to right here. Good preaching, amen. amen. <laughs> Prayer is not the last thing we should do. When we are possessed by the living God with the power of the Holy Spirit, prayer ought to be the first thing we do with everything. Did you get up this before your feet hit the floor or right after? Did you pray first this morning? A lot of people didn't. They got up dreading to get to church. They got up and looked back at the bed, and it was calling their name. And you had to pray right then, okay, Lord, do you want me to go to church or not? Well, some of you didn't pray that because you know what the Lord would say. You'd be like, mm, I don't know if I feel like it today or not. <coughs> well, are y'all okay? <laughs> Happy New Year's. <laughs> go ahead and put the next note up. Prayer has never been mentioned in the Bible as optional. Right. Prayer's never been an option for the children of God. God never even gives a hint that it's optional if you would like to. It's pray. 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 Pray to the Father. Pray to God. Pray this. Pray, pray, pray all throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, real quickly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. I want you to watch this. It says this, pray without ceasing. Now, nowhere in there do you see in parentheses if you feel like it <laughs> or if it's good enough for you today. No, very simple. In the word of God, one verse, pray without ceasing. Another translation says, pray continually. I don't know, how do we do that? You pray first about everything. Now, I'm not talking about you get, you get a so spiritually minded you're no earthly good. I don't have to pray about whether or not I'm going to eat something when it's set down before me. I pray and thank God I'm fixing to devour it. I do pray for it, though, because I'm being, the, I'm being the shredded, amen, in the name of Jesus. Now, there's things I won't be eating for the next 21 days. Help me, Jesus. Amen. But if it's not challenging me, I don't even want to fool with it. I want to be challenged in my faith these 21 days. I want to look at the, I'm, I'm, one of the things, I'll go ahead and tell you, one of the things I'm giving up is all desserts. Even Cool Whip. 
And y'all know I like Cool Whip on everything. I think it's the glory of God to top everything off. <laughs> Nothing. And I'm going to see some desserts. And I'm going to be tempted. And I'm going to say, get thee behind me, Satan. My relationship with God is more important than your calories right now and my taste buds. And if I blow it, I'm going to not blow it. <laughs> People ask me all the time, well, Pastor, what happens if I get halfway through my fast and I get weak and I have a weak moment and I do it? Well, then confess, say, Father, forgive me and strengthen me and start right back and finish strong. You'd be amazed at the people. They break their fast sometimes in a mistake or a weak moment, and they just think it's over. When you commit to 21 days, you stick out the whole 21 days. If you mess up, you say, well, whoops, sorry about that. Not going to do it again, and then you finish strong. Right. <laughs> okay? Romans chapter 12. Or excuse me, no. Pray without ceasing. Now watch this. I think this is so important, and I preach on this a decent amount here. Next verse. In everything give thanks... For this is the something. Say these next three words with me. This is the what? Will of God. It's the will of God in Christ Jesus for everybody but you. No, it doesn't say that, does it? The Bible says, now, <laughs> a lot of times people just like this verse. Give thanks in everything because it's the will of God in your life. But it, it follows with pray continually, pray without ceasing. Pray, when you pray without ceasing and you give thanks, they go together, then it's the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So how many want the will of God in your life? <laughs> Come on, how many want the will of God in your life? Well, then you've got to do what the will of God tells you to do. I, I see people all the time, Pastor, I just, I just don't know what the will of God is at this moment in my life. I do. Now, I can't, a lot of times I can't give you very specific things. Sometimes I can. But most of the time I'm going to give you, but I can give you two absolute wills for every person in here's life. And it's God that you pray continually and in everything give thanks. That's the will of God for you. And the other is in the disciples' prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer, his kingdom come, his will, his, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the will of God for you, too, because it's his will on earth in you, too, you and through you, on, on earth as it is in heaven. So if you want to know what the will and purpose of God is in your life, right there's two big ones. And if you'll start doing those two, then you'll understand why you're here. That's free. You don't get charged anything extra for that one today. Amen? But then it goes on down in Romans chapter 12, 12, and it says this. Be joyful in hope, patient in afflictions. I struggle with that one. Faithful in prayer. Now, if prayer wasn't supposed to be a part of your everyday life, why would God tell you to be faithful at it? Because if you're going to do something repetitively and consistently and excellent, then you are going to have to be faithful to it. Amen? Amen? So be joyful in the hope, patient in afflictions, and faithful to pray. Faithful to communicate with God and listen to God and watch your life take an enormous turn of faithfulness with God. Now, I'm going I'm to take a little bit different direction that we're going to wind back up in a good spot. But there's two things that I have seen, especially over probably the last, I've been pastoring going up close to 30 years now. I know I, know I don't look that young or that old. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody said it, but I'm just prophesying. But I've been doing, I've been, I've been, I've been pastoring, I've been in church from negative nine months. I was raised in my mother's womb in church. I come out in church. I've been in church my whole life. Okay? I've been pastoring for nearly 30 years. But for the last probably 20 something years, I've seen two things plague people to keep them from their maximum potential in life. And those two things are called fear and anxiety. Go ahead and put that note up. I think I've got it even there. Anxiety and fear seem to be two of the biggest problems robbing people of a full life, even Christians. As a matter of fact, I would even go so far as to say most Christians. You cannot live in the joy of the Lord because you've got something that you're anxious about, anxiety. Oh, I feel an anxiety attack coming on. Or you're fearful about something. Now let me say this. Anxiety and fear have some synonyms around them that we deal with. In case you don't understand anxiety and fear, it could be you're a worrier. Quiet in here. 
you doubt a lot of things. You doubt yourself. You doubt the salvation. You doubt God's goodness. You doubt his grace. You doubt you can ever be good enough. You doubt if you're worthy enough. You doubt if it's all really real. You doubt a lot. And then here's the big one. Because we are living in a fallen world, we've made mistakes. I was expecting a little bit better response there. We've all made mistakes. And Satan uses the shame and the guilt of our mistakes to keep us in fear and anxiety. Therefore, we cannot be all we need to be even in prayer times because we hold back because we don't feel like we're worthy to pray. Come on. We don't feel like we're worthy for God to bless us in our prayers. I know Christians who are afraid to pray thinking their prayer will make it worse. I know Christians who are afraid to dig in and pray hard because they're afraid they're going to challenge the devil on a new level. Because they've heard the old Pentecostal preachers. I'm telling you, when you go to a new level, ha, you'll face a new devil. Ha. Well, let me tell you today, you go to the new level, ha, you will face a new devil. Ha, but God will give you the power ha, to beat that devil at every level. Ha. Oh, I can do that. I can do that. He will. Don't ever be afraid to pray that you're going to invoke something more powerful than God. If you invoke something that wants to challenge God, you're with God. He'll slap that little demon's teeth out in the name of Jesus. But we have this fear and this anxiety and this worry, this doubt, this guilt and shame that is plaguing the church and the Christians from the pulpit to the back door. And it's keeping us from the power of God. Well, can I tell you, there is a cure for your anxiety, your fear, your guilt, your shame, your doubt, your worry. There's a cure for it, my friend. It's called prayer. A prayer life will cancel out anxiety and fear. That's how you can gauge someone and look at them and go, they may be praying, but they don't have a prayer life. Because they're still operating year after year after year in constant anxiety, fear, doubt, trembling. Well, I just made about half of you in here mad. That's just the way I am. <laughs> Somebody lied to you. Somebody's t- you've believed a lie somewhere. Amen. Let's run in our family. Well, it's time it runs into the power of the Holy Spirit. Because either you've got to go with fear and anxiety's lies, or you've got to go with the truth of the Bible. Now, I don't know how many of you were here a few weeks ago. I told you, is fear and anxiety real? Yes, fear and anxieties are facts. But when facts runs into the truth of God, facts can be demolished. And if you wasn't here, I'll give you the one example. Fact was, Lazarus was dead. Truth walked up and said, Lazarus, come forth. Facts went away. Truth came forth alive. Tons of examples in the Bible. When truth walks up, facts change. That's a fact, Jack. So fear and anxiety, worry, doubt, and fear. The cure is prayer. Let me give you the scripture to back that up. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 says this. Be anxious. Be anxious for what? Nothing. Do you know what nothing means in the Greek? Nothing. You got a great pastor. Teaches you the Greek. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything. Mm. By what? There it is. If you don't have prayer, you're going to be anxiety. But when you get anxious and you bring that to God in prayer, but in everything by prayer and supplication with. Many of you are disqualifying yourself from being totally set free and delivered because you're an unthankful Christian. You take it to God, throw it at him like he magically has to wave a wand and do it all. But yet you are not thankful about what he's already done. It says prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. And I preached on this a few months ago or whenever. How can you be thankful when you get the bad report? You can be thankful that you've got a God you can take that bad report to. You can take the facts to and truth can run in there and change those facts. And if those facts don't change immediately, that you've got a faith that will walk you through it anyway. Thank God you still got a breath. And if you've got breath and can fog a mirror, you've still got the hope of joy of God. But don't walk by your feelings, walk by faith. Touch your neighbor and say, get you some of that. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, now let your request be made known to God. Because listen to me now, there's something that happens when you do this, and the results is in the very next verse. But a lot of people, we, we pray the next verse, but not from this verse, not from the context of the verse in verse 6 here. We just like verse 7, but you can't get to verse 7, honey, without verse 6. Can I tell you that? I've tried it. I have. I have tried to skip the process and go straight to verse 7. I've declared verse 7. I've prophesied, and it never came until I learned how to do verse 6. Look at verse 7. When you do verse 6, verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it's going to guard your heart and your mind only way to it through Christ Jesus. Can I have a better amen right there? Can I have a better amen? It's the result of a prayer life. It's the result of a body that's praise. Are you with me? The peace of God. Whew. That's what every single person in here, including myself, want to have every day of our life. We want to walk in peace. We want peace in our mind, peace in our heart, peace in our home, peace in our marriage. Can I have a better amen there? We want peace with them teenagers. Glory. Somebody say miracle. We want peace with them toddlers. We want peace with the government. Oh, Jesus, help us. We want peace at Walmart. Now you're getting into supernatural miracles. We want peace in the parking lot. I'm trying to find one. I've seen some of y'all. The peace of God. And my favorite part of this, I'm the weird one. Most people like the peace of God, and they like guarding the heart, and they like through Christ Jesus. I like it goes beyond my understanding. Yes. It surpasses the knowledge that I have in my flesh. And see, that's where if you don't have verse 6 attached to this, you're going to continue to operate in your knowledge and your understanding, and it's going to be based on the circumstances you're walking in. Amen. And you're going to judge, and, and you're going to live your life and your responses by what you feel versus the faith of what God says happens when you pray. Amen. Now, let me back up and read this to you at one. Don't be anxious or operate in anxiety over anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, you let your request be made known to God. And then out of that, you're going to experience the peace of God. And it ain't going to be based on your feelings. Right. It's going to be based on the word and prayer of faith in God. And it's going to go beyond your feelings. And you in your mind can still be going, I don't understand it. I don't get it. This could still happen. But in your spirit, you're going, God's got it. Yeah. Man, I don't know. This is weird, but God's got it. The anxiety feelings may still be there, but they have no power over you now. Amen. You are tempted to be in anxiety. You're still tempted to be in fear. You're still tempted to worry and doubt. But you've got this weird, just I call them glory bumps sometimes get up on you. And you're like, I'm the presence of God up in here. I don't understand it. I've been given some of the, some devastating news in my past of loved ones being sick, passing away. And I'm talking about, and I, I thought, it'll make you even question if you're sane. Come on. Yes. Because the world has taught you when you get bad news, you fall apart, you cuss, you fuss, you blame everybody, you throw a hissy. Right. And when I didn't have those feelings, I'm like, is my love even real for him? Right. Come on, am I the only weird? Probably I'm the only weird one in here with this, but that's okay. And you get this flood of joy. Yeah. Are you kidding me, God, at this time? The world says I'm supposed... Be you in the world, but not of the world. Amen. And people even look at you and say, are you okay? Yeah? No, you're not. They'll try to talk you out of it. Yeah. I don't understand. We're going to try to convince somebody the grace of God's not enough for them. Right. Now, there is mourning processes. There is times of, of, of seeking God, and there are, but it's only a season. Yeah. It's never meant to be your identity for the rest of your life. Because joy comes in the morning. Yes. Can I have a better amen there? Amen. Woo, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> now, surpasses all understanding. It'll guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. And it's not going to come any other way. But through Christ Jesus means you've taken prayer through Christ Jesus to get to this. You understand that part? Make sure you don't miss that. Now, 
I want you to go back in your mind right quick, and I want you to think about, here's the 12 disciples, and Jesus traveled with the 12, and in the 12, there was an inner three, Peter, James, and John, and you had the 12, and then outside the 12, you had 120 people that followed Jesus around a lot. A lot more than that, but it was 120, 12, and 3. Are you with me? Now, can you imagine you're walking and talking with God's only son in the, in the flesh and live in color? It's amazing. You're watching him perform miracles. You're seeing the wisdom he speaks with. You're just in awe. You're sitting down having meals with him. You lay down at night. He's there beside you. You wake up. He's still there or he's praying. You don't have nothing to eat. Bam. You can't pay your taxes. Go fishing. Amen. Come on. What he told them. Can't pay your taxes. Go fishing. Women leave him men alone. They, they tax hunting. Good. That's good preaching. Yeah. <laughs> you are with Jesus in the flesh. And you even hear him talking about that he's going to be delivered in three days. He'll re- the temple will come back. He'll rebuild the temple in three days. And I must do this. And you're thinking, no, man, yeah, I hear him talking, but man, he's just. And then they see it happen. And they have been following this man, and they are also an enemy of the government. Because they're followers of Jesus. That's why they denied him that last day. Peter denied him three times. No, no, I don't know, man. Well, I tell you, I ain't part of this bunch. Why? Anxiety and fear begin to set in. Because who they thought was going to save them in a different way was now hanging on the cross and even pronounced dead. Taken off the cross, wrapped up, and slammed up in a tomb. Looked final, looked factual. Can you imagine the anxiety and fear and doubt and worry these people were going through? Come on now. We think we got some things to worry about. Think about that. Put that in your pipe. Take a toke on that and see what kind of worry comes your way. I can't imagine the anxiety and the fear and the worry these cats were going through. But God knew they were going to have that. And God didn't leave them without a way to not operate that their life. Because he knew that he was going to equip them to launch what you and I enjoy today. Right. So we're going to go there. The next note. Prayer is what brought the First Testament church into the power of God. It was the avenue of prayer that brought the power of God to the first church of the New Testament, New Covenant of God. Through prayer. Prayer. Let me prove it to you. And I don't have to, I want to encourage you sometime this week. Hopefully you'll, now let me tell you something else about fasting. Maybe you need to fast from something to something. We always hear about fasting from something, but you fast from something to something. So if you haven't had a prayer life, let's fast from not having a prayer life to having a prayer life. Let's fast from not studying the Word of God on a daily basis. Let's fast to start studying the Word on a daily basis. Okay, that's free too. But I don't have time to go all the way through this, so I'm just going to hit the highlights, okay? But I want to encourage you to fast to reading Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, which was the launch of the church of the New Covenant Church of Jesus. Coming out of the old covenant because now the blood has been shed of the lamb. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus had told them after his resurrection, Jesus appeared before them. And he said, I want you to go tarry or I want you to go wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise that the Father has promised to empower you with. Now, how many knows if God said, I promise you, I want you to have this, it's going to be good. Because all good things come from God. And Jesus, the Son, is saying, it is a promise of the Father, but you've got to go wait on it. I want you to go back into Jerusalem, all the way to the center core, find your place, get in that upper room, and tarry for it. But he just didn't say wait. Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Next verse says, and when they had entered, they went up in the upper room and where they were staying and there was Peter 
and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew. There was James, the son of Alphaeus. There was Simon, the zealot. And there was Judas, the son of James, not to be confused. Next verse says, these all continued. Everybody say continued. That means they started something and it was still happening. When they got in that upper room, they began to do something. And what they began to do, the Bible says, they continued. And these continued in one accord, which means they got come into unity. They come into unity. They all had different things and thoughts and stuff, but they shed that off to say, we're here for a purpose to get the Father. We have been promised something. Let's get into unity and get this something. Amen. Now, what's the Bible? According, they come into one mind and one accord in prayer. In prayer. Now, I've already given you an example of how we're, we're not in unity. That doesn't matter. Some of you are Auburn fans. And let me tell you, it don't matter. No, I'm just kidding. Some of you are Alabama fans. It don't matter. That's irrelevant. And now if you make it a God, you're sinning. I like to have fun with it because it's not my God. We don't have to be in unity on the football teams. My favorite color is red. You don't have to have the same colors I do for us to walk as a brotherly love. But let me tell you something. We have to unify on who God is. We have to unify on the power that we need to advance his kingdom. That's non, that's, that's, when we don't have unity in that, in the basics of this word right here, now we got a problem. But no one, let me tell you something, this is why they prayed in unity. Because no one praying in the unity of the Holy Spirit is going to hear something different than the other one's going to hear. Nobody in here today is going to pray and say, I think the year 2023 ought to be the year we go out here and start killing people. Now, you may feel that way sometimes, but when you run it through the Word of God, the Spirit of God, ain't no way that's God. Amen. But when I say to you, the Spirit of God in 2023 wants us to go out here and love people and share Christ with them, do you know why you can come into unity with me on that? Because it's not about me, it's about the Word of God. Right. Are you seeing this? So what happened was they got in that upper room, and we know it was 10 days. They were in there, 10, it probably took them 10 days to get over their selves yeah, to where they really got in unity. But here they are, they're one chord, prayer with supplication, with the women. The women was there. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Can I have a better amen? amen. <laughs> I love it. But they continued in unity of prayer. And then the tenth day came. It was the day of the feast of Passover. They didn't know it was going to come on that day. They just knew that God had promised them something. Jesus told them, there's a promise of the Father awaiting you in that room. You go tarry until you get it. But you be in prayer and unity and it'll come. Are you with me? When you, the body of Christ, comes together in unity of prayer, the promise of the Father will show up on you. It was ten, on the 10th day, again, they didn't know it, but it was the launch, now they knew it was the launch of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, which was a feast, not a denomination. Good preaching there. It's a feast of Israel. And that's the day, apparently, they got it right. And they got into the type of prayer and unity that the body of Christ needs. And so now we go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now watch this. Now we're talking about a body that prays. They're praying. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, again, in one accord in one place. They were in unity together. Are you with me? Amen. Now watch this next verse. And suddenly, I love that about God. He didn't just kind of creep them into it suddenly. I mean, I think they had a general expectation. And another reason that he made them wait 10 days is they kind of got out of their expectation mode and just got into prayer mode. Or maybe they just got into full desperation. I don't know. But somehow on that 10th day, it was nailed, hallelujah, and suddenly there came a sound, and it was from heaven, and it was as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now listen to me now. 
more than likely there was not 120 of them available in the upper room because it wasn't that big. But if you read a while ago, it said they went up. They went to their dwelling and then they went up into the upper room. I'm sure some of them was probably downstairs praying also. There had to be a time when someone was down there probably fixing meals to eat, <coughs> keeping the place clean, but yet they were still in unity of what they were seeking, the promise of the Father. That's why the Bible says, and it filled the whole house. It didn't say it filled just the upper room. Right. Woo! Yes. That gets me excited. That means, that means if you out there in the bathroom right now listening to me because we got speakers in there, you can get it while you go into the bathroom. Yes. Amen? And it filled the house where they were sitting. Now watch verse 3. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. One set upon each one of them. Nobody got left out. Why didn't nobody get left out? Because they were in unity of prayer. The women didn't get left out. The young men didn't get left out. The older men didn't get left out. Those who had a problem didn't get left out. Those who had a bad attitude didn't get left out. Why? Because they prayed themselves out of all that junk to get to the Father. And so they all, it set upon each of them. Now watch this, verse 4. And they were all. Do you all know what all means in the Greek? It means all, every one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And bless God, this is in your Bible. And they all began to speak with other tongues. Not as they chose to, but as the Spirit gave them utterance. Because the Spirit ain't going to fill you and then not have nothing to do with you. The Spirit's got a voice. The Spirit's got a message it wants to get out. <laughs> well, Happy New Year. So do you see what happened through prayer? Prayer released the promise of the Father when they got in unity as a body of Christ and prayed as a body. And the power of God was launched in their life that day. They began to speak in tongues. The fire of God was on them, to them, and through them. Can I have a better amen there? So it was through the unity of prayer that they received the promise of the Father, which was what we call in the church today, in the Pentecostal realm anyway, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were baptized with fire. So it happened to them. I'm sure they had a goose bump. Don't y'all imagine they had a goose bump? I imagine they had a goose, a glory bump, and everything else bump. I think the hair was standing up on the back of their neck. I think they was probably shaking and quaking in the presence of that woo, full manifestation of the power of God. And that, oh, that's a sweet feeling. But it does you nothing if you just keep the feeling. What good does that do anybody else? Oh, praise God, I felt good. Okay, good. How did anybody get saved? No. Anybody get delivered? No. Anybody get set free? No, but I felt good. I got the glory bump. Look, God bless me. Well, hallelujah. What'd you do with it? Nothing. I just felt blessed. Well, congratulations. Feel blessed all you want to, but now you need to bless somebody else. Yes. But we're stingy blessers. <laughs> Come on. We're so conceited. We think, oh, just get me blessed. I'll go home. No. You get blessed, you go bless somebody else. You get saved? Yeah, I got saved back then. How many's got saved because you got saved? Nobody. I'm keeping it to myself. <laughs> you stingy little snot. <laughs> Who told you you could get saved and hang on to it and not share it with nobody? You ain't going to find that in the Bible. So the power came to them. You want to know why God got them in unity and through prayer? Because he waited till the unity in that body came through praying before he released this kind of power. Because if they had not been unified and they'd want to do their own thing and they got that power, they would have messed everything up. But when you come into unity with the power of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to do it God's way, not your way. They begin to speak with other tongues. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. So the power of God now has come to them. But what I love about them, they didn't want it just to them for their self. They bust up out of that room and they hit them streets, and now what happened to them, they were sharing through them. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. They didn't keep it in the church. They didn't keep it in the upper room. They didn't keep it upstairs and downstairs, say, oh, we've really been blessed by God. We're now the hierarchy. No, they hit the streets. They came out of that upper room, and they began to use their tongue to speak in everyone's language where they could understand the message of God. 
Good preaching, amen. The power of the Holy Spirit coming to them was so that they would be empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit to now go out and establish and advance the kingdom of God church that God birthed to have. He died to have. And they said, use us, Lord. We're here. We're in unity. We believe. We receive. And we're not just going to receive. Now what we got, we're going to start giving it away. And that's how the church of the new covenant of Jesus Christ was launched. Prayer and power. Don't get excited. Because when they got the power of the Spirit, they understood it is now to grow his church. And can I tell you, the church needed to be grown back then. And the church needs to grow today. But let me tell you something. We ain't going to grow church no other way except the way Jesus declared it in the beginning. Through prayer and fasting and coming into unity and being powered by the Holy Spirit. That's what grows churches. That's what puts the power of God to bring people in and watch them get saved and set free and delivered, restore their marriage, restore their relationship with their kids, raising kids up to the glory of God, abolishing sin in our life. Well, nobody likes that anymore. But it's still the same for today. Because the Bible says he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to close on this going up. Acts chapter 2, so they go wait, they get in unity, they wait in unity, they pray in unity because God told them to do that. He's still telling the church to do that today, but we don't have time, we're too busy, Lord. It's all I can do to make a service every once, maybe once or twice a month. There's a lot of churches right now, and I thank God we're not one of them, but they said, well, you know what, I don't have to go to the building anymore. I can stay in my pajamas and watch it online when I get ready, real convenient church. I heard a statistic coming in up the mountain this morning. 20, over 23 plus thousand churches have shut down during COVID. They shut down. And then the pastor that was preaching, telling them about it, he said, and that's a good thing. I caught my attention too. And then he followed it up because if you can't stand against COVID, how are you going to stand against the wiles of the devil? If you think COVID is the worst thing you ever faced, you ain't read your Bible. You ain't ready to face anything. That's why I say the body's got to get ready for good and bad. Because the body will be good no matter what bad comes along. As long as, we're, as, long, as long as you and I are in unity over this right here, it don't matter what happens. <laughs> don't worry. You're taken care of. Whew, I ain't got time to preach that. But, so here they are. They get the blessed promise. They are now baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit. They're walking in the supernatural things of God. And they bust out. And I think God's got a sense of humor. The very one that was called out that you will deny me three times before the rooster crows today. And absolutely denied him three times. He's the very first one that starts preaching with power. It's no longer the disciple Peter. The apostle Peter now has appeared. You understand, he went from being a disciple to an apostle like that in the upper room. Before, they were disciples. You remember that? They were disciples. They didn't come out of that upper room disciples anymore. They came out as apostles. Let that roast. I'll be preaching on that later on. So the apostle Peter is preaching in these next verses. And he is preaching with the power of the Holy Spirit now. He's not afraid to die. He's not afraid that if he, do, if he don't deny Christ, they're going to hurt him. He's not afraid anymore. He's not anxious and anxiety, worry, fear, doubt, all that crap's gone. Why? Prayer, power, new apostle. So the apostle Peter's preaching. He's doing good, too. Acts chapter 2, only two more verses. Verse 40 and verse 42. Clint, put that up. And with many other words, he, talking about the Apostle Peter here, he testified and he exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And if that message is not still as true today as it was back then, we live in a perverted in the time. And I can tell you today, get out of that perversion and be saved in the name of Jesus. I ain't got no other message than what the Apostle preached here. Get saved from this perverse generation, people. You're hearing me. Today you need to get saved from it. 
Now watch what happened here. Next verse. Those who gladly received his word were what? They were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Wow. We don't see those results anymore. You want to know why? Because we've not prayed in unity, and we've not been empowered, all of us. Every one of them got the same power. There wasn't no different levels of power. They all got baptized with the Holy Spirit. They all got the tongues of fire. All of them. 120 people literally established the new covenant church because they prayed in unity, and they received power, and then they wasn't ashamed of it. So people heard this man preaching, 3,000 got added to him in one day, and they all got baptized too. That's awesome. But now, I want to break this down. I'm going to take a little time, so we're in overtime, so just hang on to your seat. Get up on the edge of the seat, because you paid for all of it, but you're only going to need the edge of it now. (laughs) Now, I do have to take time to break this down, because I don't want you to leave here today without this right here, because this is where we're going to get to. Those who gladly received the apostle's word, this is the apostle Peter preaching here, they were saved, we know, because they, they got baptized, so they accepted Christ, right? Yeah. We all agree with that, right? We're all in unity on that? Yeah. This is 3,000, got up to 3,000 got saved that day. Never had to think about 3,000. So these are not apostles that's gotten saved. These are lost people that have just come in to make themselves part of the body of Christ. They're not, uh, there's no apostle there except the ones preaching. There's no apostle. There's no prophet. None of them were evangelists. None of them were teachers. And none of them were preachers. They were just average, ordinary men and women who heard the word of God and said, we want to be a part of this body of Christ. We want to be a part of this church, this ecclesia. Right? Are y'all seeing this? I want to make sure you see it. Don't just take my word. Look at the word. The they there, the, then those. The those there means just, just regular old church folk. Get up and go to church, folk. 3,000 of them. But now watch the results that God said. This is the assignment, not just to the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, but this is the assignment to the church body. There's so many things that people look at church leadership. Y'all do this. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. I'm going to look at you and say, you need to be doing this. Because my job is to teach you this. Go ahead and put up the next verse, verse 42. And they, the church folks, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Now, again, the apostles doing the preaching here. You can call him a pastor if you don't understand the word apostle right now. The apostle was Peter. The pastor, Peter. The prophet, Peter. The evangelist. Did, Peter was covering basically everything. The whole fivefold was operating into him. So they followed the teachings continually of the Word of God that the apostle was preaching. Next thing. And they also fellowshiped. They wasn't too busy to do life groups. They wasn't too busy. They know they needed to get around some fellow believers. They knew they needed to be in unity with like-minded people to make themselves strong. They believed, the pre- they, they believed and continued to listen to the pastor or the apostle. They fellowshiped together, both in the church and outside the church. How do I know? Because Acts 20, 20 says they went from house to house. Life groups is more scriptural than Sunday school is. Did you know that? Life groups are more scriptural because they meet outside the church and in homes and in different places than it is coming to the church house just for another meeting. Now, I'm not against Sunday school. You know what Sunday school is? It's Sunday life groups. It's a small group discussing things of the Bible and sharing. So get both of them began. They listened to the apostles. They continued steadfast, faithful to the apostles' doctrine. They fellowshiped in the church, outside the church. Now watch this. In the breaking of bread. If you study that translation, the breaking of bread, they ate meals together, regular meals, and they also took communion in these groups. So they ate fellowship together, but in the, sometimes they'd get together and they would break bread and they would do communion together. And this is the church. This is church folks. Oh, and by the way, now the, go back, continued steadfastly 
to listen to the word. They continued steadfastly to be in fellowship in the church. They continually steadfast to be fellowship outside the church. They steadily and continued to get together and have meals together. They continually, steadily had communion together. And they continually and steadfastly prayed together. And I'm talking about the church body. Not the leaders, not the, not the senior pastor, whatever you want to call it, but the church. The ones that had just got brand new saved, green the cows are mooing, so they're so green. Cows are grazing on your back, you're so green. Out there just a mooing. I'm still so green. I hear moos every morning because I'm still growing and learning in Christ. But that is the responsibility of every single born-again believer. And if you want to bless 2023, my friend, you better start right here. Because don't try to go any further until you can pray. You hear me? Don't try to go up and cast demons out unless you prayed first. Anything you're going to do outside of just something that is such a, even maybe some of them is the Lord convicts you. When you get, before you get up, pray. Before you start your job at work, pray. Before you go to town, get in your car to drive, pray. Man, you better pray. Hey, some idiots out there. If you're going to go on vacation or go on a trip, pray before you leave that driveway. If you're going to sit down to eat a meal, you better pray. Have you ever been in their kitchens? You better pray. You seen the workforce that's handing you your food today? You better pray. Y'all stand to your feet. Oh, wow. Prayer is the very thing God gave the, God gave them the Holy Spirit through. Amen? For his new covenant, New Testament church so they could be equipped and grow his kingdom church while they were on the earth. And I can tell you this right here. The only reason we're here today is because of praying churches in the past. From the very first church of the apostles to the churches and the moms and the grandmothers and the dads and the former pastors and deacons and elders and church members that got a hold of the Word of God and began to pray for the next generation. That's the only reason we're still here today. But I want to make sure that my kids and my grandkids know a stronger church than this church. And it ain't going to be that way unless we're working in strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me, church? The Holy Spirit's power is still God's method to equip his saints to do the work of ministry. Now I'm going to wind this thing down. And I know I mentioned something some of you may not be familiar with called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you that it's nothing to be scared of? And some of you are going, well, does this church believe in that stuff? Let me make sure you have no question in your mind. We absolutely believe in it. Well, why do you believe in that? Because it's in the Bible. Well, what about you, Pastor? I mean, you, yes, I do. I prayed in tongues this morning before I ever come out of here. I prayed in tongues at the house. I prayed in tongues on the way up to the church, and I prayed in tongues right before I come up here. Shandala. Well, I didn't hear you. Well, you didn't have to hear me. It ain't about the show. It's about the power to grow. I pray in English a lot. I pray in the Spirit a lot. I sing in English sometimes. I also sing in the Spirit sometimes, and you don't want to hear that either. Either one of them. But God enjoys it. It didn't make me weird. It made me more powerful and more tuned in. Yeah. And let me tell you something. If you want to start your new year off right and you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, we invite you to come up and do that too today. Yeah. But the first thing you got to do is be saved. That's the main thing. Yeah. And let me dismiss something real quick. You do not have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues to go to heaven. Tongues does not get you to heaven. Dear God, could we please get off of that? Tongues does not get you to heaven. The blood of Jesus Christ is what gets you to heaven. There is no salvation in any other means except Jesus Christ. But I will tell you this. It, it, it was and is the promise of the Father to his believers. And if he promised me salvation, I, won't, I got saved. He promised me I could be forgiven of my sins. It was from God. I got forgiven of my sins. 
He promised me I could know him and talk to him through prayer. I got that. It was wonderful. He also, I discovered, promised me I could be baptized in the Holy Spirit and have another language. I didn't know much about it, but if I believed God for all that other stuff, why why not? And when it happened, it wasn't nothing like I thought it would be. It was so peaceful. It wasn't weird. But I ain't going to go into that whole testimony there. I'm just telling you guys, it's real. It is of God the Father. It's his promise to every believer. But again, you must be a believer first. So let's just bow your head real quickly. If you're here this morning and you've never, ever, ever surrendered your life to Christ, we don't offer you a church membership today. We don't want you to join church today. We're not offering you a religion or a denomination. We don't want you to get religious or we don't want you to be in a denomination today. We offer you the one who died for your sin, was buried and conquered death, hell, and the grave on your behalf. And he's the only one that can pay your sin debt for you. And he is the way, the truth, and the life to get to heaven. And there is no other way. That's what we offer you to begin your journey today with. It's just Jesus Christ surrendering your life to him. And it's an adventure. You'll go on. It'll be the best thing you've ever done. It's such a learning, and it's always a learning. And always growing. But you've got to start with acknowledging you cannot save yourself. You cannot work your way there. And you can't pay your own debt. You can only receive it by the grace of God and the free, 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 free love of God by surrendering your life to serve Him and accepting Him as your Lord and Savior. And if you'd like to do that, just simply right now, just slip your hand up and say, I'm not going to waste another day, much less another year, without Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that's you today, just lift your hand up. Anybody. Maybe if you're watching at home, wherever, overseas, same thing, let us know. But today, I want to encourage you Get yourself a prayer life. One that leads to the power of God like the first church had. It's not just for the pastors and apostles and prophets events. not just for the worship team. It is for every born again believer to be in the word, in his church, serving, witnessing to people, fellowshipping together, life groups together, communion together, and praying together. You can do this, I promise you, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So if that's you today and you say, I want my first fruit offering today to the Lord on this Sunday. We give him the day. Can I tell you the day is already his? But we acknowledge it is the first. But if you really want to give God a first fruit offering, he wants you. He wants you to be the first fruit offering for the rest of the year. He wants you to make a commitment and steadfast commitment, determined that I'm going to pray better than I've prayed any year of my life for the rest of my life. And I'm going to get the power of God flowing to me and through me. And if that's you and you want it more, or you want it deeper, or you just want more double portion, just lift your hand to God. Come on, lift your hand to God. And I've got both of mine up because I want this to be a double portion year. Now, The Bible says we pray, we bring the supplications and prayer to him with thanksgiving. So I want to lead you in a prayer. You can just repeat after me. Father, I come to you with thanksgiving. Thank you. I made it all the way through 2022. And I'm coming into this fresh new year. Today is the first first Sunday. But I am am a first first child today. And I make a steadfast commitment to pray more this year, more effective, more powerfully than I ever have before. And may it be all, 100%, for your glory, God. I thank you again. You hear my prayer. I thank you. You've already answered it. And I thank you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can do this for your glory. And in your name, I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, give him glory in this house. Amen.